What's up, Lab Code Agents? I'm Vanessa Noble from Anchorage, Alaska, and I am really, really excited to host this series on uh, commercial multifamily investing. And today I have a really amazing guest who is super smart in this space. Uh, his name is Brad Penley. Uh, he is in Florida and he's not a realtor. So number one, uh, before, you know, we kind of figure out, you know, who's this person and from what lens are they uh, speaking from? I uh, just want to give you a, a little bit of context of who he is and where he's from and what he does. So Brad, can you you. Thank you for, uh, for being on and can you just tell us a little bit about, well, who you are outside of investing and how you ended up in investing and then we'll go from there. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Vanessa. And hey, everybody out there watching. Um, my name is Brad Pinley. I'm currently the executive officer at the Naval Diving and Salvage Training Center in Panama City, Florida um, as an active duty uh, explosive ordnance disposal naval officer. Um, and <laughs> what that does that mean to like a normal person? <laughs> so what that means to Not a normal fair. person, if anybody ever saw the movie Hurt Locker, um, the guy that puts on the bomb suit and goes down and defuses bombs, um, that's what I've, I've done for my military career um, for 13 years. So um, I've been, uh, I was a graduate of the United States Naval Academy in 2007 uh, in the heat of the war and then uh, went in to do roadside bombs. Um, and which taught me a lot about risk mitigation. It's one of my specialties that I bring to uh, large apartment syndications um, and to multi-unit investing, um, but also gave me a, a very uh, solid background um, in having the fundamentals right. Um, and you'll hear me come across that a, a ton during this interview. Um, but money flows to confidence. Um, money doesn't really flow to good deals. Money doesn't flow to nice countertops or great uh, closets. Money flows to confidence. Um, so all those people in, in whatever sphere you're in, whether it be uh, on the investing side or if you're on the agent side, um, having that confidence with confidence um, behind you kind of can propel you along. That military career also got me started into um, multifamily investing. Um, how, how did that happen? So the way the military works, and especially EOD, explosive ordnance disposal, is uh, for the officers, they move us every two years, um, which means I've done five cross-country um, drives so far during that 13-year military career to go from different stations from Florida to California to Virginia, back to California, back to Florida, and now back to California later this year. Um, but when I was a very, very junior officer um, and I was actually out playing ultimate Frisbee with the whole command, um, my commanding officer at the time was a big guy named George Byford. And uh, he, he hit me really hard on the field and kind of knocked me down, picked me up kind of by the shoulders and shook me. He said, I want you to remember two things. I was like, first, never underestimate an old man. <laughs> B, buy a place everywhere you go buy a house everywhere you go and uh huh. i don't know whether it was the hit um him <laughs> it's me. the emotion of that i don't know happened. really what it was oh, that made yeah. it stick um and i didn't you know for the first i don't want to say five years i was living on a sailboat and then uh i loved living on sailboats and that's eventually the the dream of of my passive income um is to be able to to live on a boat full-time sail around the world um and do different missions projects so that kind of got me into the why, why I'm so hungry after the knowledge that will then hopefully give me the competence to be able to go out and execute um, some of these larger deals. I love that. I always, I actually always say that myself, like the reason why I sell real estate is so that I can go to ministry. You know, I'm like, I need to go back to that. So that's awesome. It's a, it's a very strong motivation when you feel that like need to create the leverage in your life to do, to do other things. Right. Absolutely. And um, so from a real estate standpoint, it's often, you know, we kind of look at the commercial world and the residential world as two completely different arenas. Uh, although they re do require a different skill set, you know, in my arena, which is smaller level residential multifamily, like teaching veterans how to get in that space. And that's kind of where I grew my skill set and my wheelhouse. Um, you know, 
it really is, it seems daunting to cross over from residential, um, residential mindset to a commercial mindset. And even when I help agents kind of see that every, every purchase is an investment, regardless of what they're buying, when we scale up into that larger level, larger asset, larger dollar, we're dealing with different types of consumers, different types of sellers, um, different types of assets, huge, a lot more risk when there's bigger dollars involved. So those are some things that are, that are harder to overcome, as well as finding the actual seller, finding the buyer is a different muscle because every agent knows how to find a buyer and a seller, or at least they should. So take me through some of those really gritty tactical level things that a realtor would have to understand to even get into the space. And then maybe we'll talk about the skill set that. You okay. Um, so what I like to say is that uh, these large commercial multifamily apartments, I'll say hundred plus unit apartments, they're not actually that much harder to buy than single family homes. They just look scarier because there's more of them. The numbers are bigger, but it's actually not that much more of a refined skill set. Um, you're still dealing with brokers. It's a little bit different in the large commercial world because about 90, 95% of the deals are held with brokers. Um, they're not on an MLS listing. What that forces both uh, a buyer to do and or a seller to do is have relationships, which is what every single realtor should be working for in the first place. This, this so industry most, is- Most are not brokered. Because they're not on there. They are held with brokers. There's not a, an MLS type system. Um, there are some called on LoopNet, which is kind of like the MLS for large commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. However, um, those are usually most of the kind of trash deals. Um, when you get into <laughs> large commercial real estate, um, the brokers have pocket listings or they have previously sold a large apartment complex. They, they kind of have a number that they know that the owner might be interested in and selling it at. Um, also, when you, we start to work with these brokers, they start reaching out to people that own these assets and say, hey, I've got a, I've got a buyer who's interested in this, in this range and it, it fits your asset, it fits what I would think you would want in income, would you be willing to sell? Um, so it's a lot more relationship based. And even for the small residential um, agents out there, this is still the case. If you're brand new, or especially if you've been in it for a while, as you have, Vanessa, you know that um, the person you sold a house to two years ago, five years ago, they might call you back up um, to be the selling agent, or they might be looking for a bigger house when they add a kid on, um, or they might have friends and family that are coming to the area. So it's all very relationship based. It's even more so in commercial real estate when you're talking um, to the commercial brokers, you're talking to the commercial lenders. Um, so what we do is we focus on our market that we're going to be in the specific area that we got, we want to be in. We do a lot of metropolitan statistical analysis, which is like basically a big phrase for, we look at some spreadsheets and they're not <laughs> even that difficult. I mean, and you're, like you're talking about like all the community demographics, the, 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 all of the different economies that influence what's happening in that market. And then also like the retail businesses that are following that. Right. 100%. So this applies for a single family home or a 400 unit complex. When you're, looking, it again, at again, an right. and when you're looking at making an investment, it's all about location and those demographics. Um, so we look kind of first at population. Um, for our business model, we don't actually look at a population less than half a million. So 500,000 people. And that kind of right off the bat spreads risk across hopefully multiple different industries, um, a large population. We look at economic growth, so we want to see that jobs are flowing into that market. We're looking at population growth, that that market um, is increasing in size. Um, and we look at income growth. We're looking at the, the type of growth um, those jobs are providing. And hopefully that'll allow us to slowly increase rents as we increase the standard of living at the, at the asset. How is this like single family homes? Well, it's, it's the same deal. If you want to invest in single family homes, First, you got to look at the market. You got to look at hopefully find very easy assets. And if anybody's interested, can hit me up on how to find some of these, this information. But the Census Bureau has a lot of fantastic information. A lot of universities has have housing and development information. Um, there's national committees on housing that have free data 
for anybody to kind of reach out and look at a particular area for investors. Or if they are in a particular area and they're focusing on that, find the drivers of economy in that area. Get to know that data in your area. It's not enough to know, again, that this house has nice countertops and a great closet. Well, that's great. If everybody's fleeing that city, um, if all the jobs are dried up, that nice countertop, that, that is worthless. bathroom is, is worthless. It's not going to do anything for you. Um, so I would challenge every single investor or agent has to think like an investor. You can't think like just an agent. Um, most likely, you're going to be talking to, to two kinds of clients. You're going to be talking to a couple um, and one of them is going to be the numbers person. Either the one of the others right. is going to be the numbers person, or you're talking to a single individual, which is a higher likelihood that you're talking to an invested mind or person um, who's right. looking to invest their money. Um, so in either category, you have to have that that baseline competence on investing. You have to have that baseline vocabulary on investing. You have to know what a cash on cash return on investment is. And that's not any different if you're buying a single family home or if you're buying a hundred unit complex, that cash on cash return on investment is going to spread across, um, across the bread, as we say. And I love when you say that, because as you know, and as I know, people who interview agents on a regular basis, most realtors aren't thinking about any sort of return on a real on a single family real estate asset. They're not looking at what is your dollars in and your dollar return, whether it's your equitable position or whether it's the potential cash flow on it as a held asset that's going to rent in that market. You know, even if you're just making a subjective pro forma on this property, um, or you know, just looking at what is what is the what is the value of this property from an investment standpoint, and how is the property appreciating in that market cycle? And any like people don't typically extrapolate those those concepts to this, you know, to to a single family asset. Right, and I like to bounce back to Warren Buffett's quote that I I heard when I was uh, I think a teenager and I was reading his book. Um, the number one rule of investing is don't lose money. <laughs> and almost every single person that will buy a house, um, they are thinking of it as an investment. They don't want to lose money when right. they have a house. They don't want to go into a house being like, you know what? I'm going to lose all kinds of money. <laughs> There's not a single buyer out there that's just like, yep, I'm just going to burn this uh, inside this, uh, this roof right. structure. In my defense, if you get people in San Diego or I have had some higher level buyers that don't care about burning some money, which... Is harder a harder pill for someone like myself to swallow um, because they 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 maybe just throw money at things because they have money to to throw away. But if we're take we're your buyer that's actually looking at building an investment portfolio and as we help people build wealth for themselves um, through real estate investing, either if single family or not or otherwise, it really is important to to look at that. Well, even if they're looking to to burn money, throw money away, or be frivolous. It's your job as an agent to be a fiduciary on their behalf. Right. You have to be, you have to give them the pros and the cons, mm -hmm. um, especially the cons and be like, here's why this shouldn't work. And if you show some of these people who don't, you know, or think they throw money away, if you show them a spreadsheet and you're like, Hey, see line, you're in the uh, red, C9, yeah. <laughs> this is how much in the red you are. So they may be frivolous until they see hard numbers. Um, yeah. And and so the the spreadsheets I use for single family home investing versus um, a slightly more complicated spreadsheet that I use for multi unit investing, um, the spreadsheet only gets a little bit more in depth because as I've gone along and I told you that kind of risk management mindset I have from explosive ordnance disposal, what we're trying to do for our investors is limit as much risk as humanly possible while giving them the highest returns. That's also your job as a real estate agent when right. you're, you're talking your, your tenant through. Yeah, you can buy this house on this swamp that's three feet under the flood zone. Um, <laughs> and you can choose, you know, in Florida not to have, have hazardous winds insurance. But is that the wisest thing? Is this the best thing for you um, right. as what you've told me your strategic goal is? Um, and all that large commercial real estate has done is kind of opened my eyes. It's made me better at every single level 
um, from medium sized commercial real estate to looking at um, self storage units to looking at mobile home parks to looking at uh, two to four unit multifamily to looking at single family homes. I can never look at a single family home the same again. I can never go into buying a single family home without having a spreadsheet and looking at what potential rents are. Because I'll right. venture to say very few of your clients or any of the clients of the people that are out there looking, when you ask them, is this the last home you're ever going to live in? I would venture to say less than 10% are going to be like, yep, this is it. I'm, I'm putting my flag down, dying in this house. Um, <laughs> and even then, even mm -hmm. if they say they're dying in this house, they might have children later that'd be like, no, we got to put them, you know, in a home. As I tell my mother, um, I'll get a nice <laughs> golf cart. <laughs> uh, I say, hey, mom. Hey, nice. don't be me. See, I'm Mexican. I, we keep our family in our house. Oh, uh, I, 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 we've been telling her since we were teenagers <laughs> that if she keeps mouthing off like that, she, we're sending her to the home with a nice golf cart, with a nice golf cart. But um, it, so every single one of these investors, or I call them investors because that's how my mind works. Every single one of your buyers, um, buyers mm -hmm. they have to have some kind of exit plan built in or as a responsible agent and fiduciary of, of your buyers, you can make a plan for them and, and you, know, you can pull up a single. And not a lot of, not enough realtors think this way. And I think from you and I, it's a little easier to always think that that cautionary because a lot of realtors will just go into this and say, well, they want to buy it. Here's a sale. And that's that. Here's my paycheck, right? I did yeah. a job. And you'll get, one sale. And yeah. you'll get one sale. But if you take care of the person more than you would take care of yourself, and that's the kind of the fiduciary part mm -hmm. of the job that you have. If you take care of the other person more than they would take care of themselves or more than you would normally take care of them, if they're just, hey, this is just one deal that's when you build on repetitive processes. That's when you get referrals. Um, that's when they're like, hey, I interviewed Tidmaker for real estate it. agents. Yeah. This is the only one that showed me a spreadsheet. Right. And you and, know, it's funny because even in a conversation, I don't even have to bring out a spreadsheet because let's be real, like I'm not a fan of spreadsheets. Um, but I do, I do like, you know, looking at them just to make decisions. But even when I talk to my buyers from an analytical perspective, mitigating risk for the way that they are making decisions, I have people call me all the time and say, you've given me more insight than any other realtor I've spoken to because you're looking at the holistic picture, not just the purchase, but the exit strategy and how that is going to affect everything else. Yeah. The and then not only if you can talk about it, but if you can show it, if you can show what an exit strategy at year three versus year 10 looks like, um, of which that's why I don't, I'm not a spreadsheet guy. Now I'm, I'm so blessed to be on an amazing team and have two spreadsheet gurus because it makes <laughs> me go cross-eyed. Um, I much, I much rather be talking to investors doing investor relations and capital raises and stuff that really gets me excited. Um, as soon as I get in front of the spreadsheet, it kind of sucks the life out of me. Um, but Hey, that's why I love also love this game, this real estate game and especially commercial real estate. And even in the agents there, it's a team sport, find somebody that can do spreadsheets and show you how to do it. There's tons of podcasts out there, webinars. Um, there is a plethora of YouTube that can walk you through a simple spreadsheet. And I'm not talking about building your own spreadsheet. These things come color coordinated. Now I learned how <laughs> in elementary school, the you color inside the lines, you know, you color inside the lines. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, and it goes and they're, they're color coordinated. You, they're like yellow box, put in purchase price, boom, another yellow box, put in, um, the interest, boom, the number of years, 30. Okay. Um, and then how much of a down payment and it's spits out different numbers. Um, and then what you want to do as an agent is you want to be projecting what the rents in that area would be if this person is forced to leave and they have to rent their house out. How much like rent the military. Like, yeah, the military. like the military. So that's kind of what pushed, pushed me into doing this and thinking about it when I had to leave. And then maybe it wasn't the right time in the market, uh, market cycle to buy again, or it wasn't especially for me, as I leave a duty station, it might not be the right time for me to sell it. Um, or I don't have enough equity in it to sell it. Maybe it needs another year or two, maybe five. And um, so I have, to, I have to know when I can hit the number where I don't lose money, Warren Buffett's rule number one. 
So do you mind if I put you on the hook for something? Sorry, I know you weren't expecting yeah, this. Yeah, shoot. But if people put their email here, can you package together? Because I'm going to ask you to talk about books and stuff. Can we send out an email that basically has the list of like, just things like here's a, here's a, here's a similar spreadsheet. Here's a website. Here's three books. So everything we're talking about, can we put this on an email that whoever requests the information? Cause this is a lot of content, especially if it's foreign that even trying to like scratch notes on is going to be harder to. Absolutely. Well, I will start off with for every real estate agent and this is agent. Cause um, how did you get so smart and finish your sentence though? <laughs> I got so smart because I made, I made bad decisions. <laughs> I got, <laughs> so we can learn from you. <laughs> yeah. I made bad decisions. I, I bought a single family home that I didn't do any of this with. I was like, this is pretty in a nice area. Didn't think about it. Didn't use spreadsheets. Um, that one's still hurting the books. Um, <laughs> then I lived on a sailboat, which was a depreciating asset or a depreciating liability um, for several years. Um, before like I got jarred one time again and remembered my old commanding officer telling me to buy a place and I don't even know how I bought the first multi-unit place. I don't know who had told me it just kind of came in through the ether. Um, and so I bought that as, as a, a quizzical thing as well. And it wasn't until, um, my brother, actually, I have two military brothers as well. They started doing some of the same things and thinking some of the same things and, and running into the same problems that one of my brothers like, Hey dude, you got to read this book. So I will give out a little prop to this one. Um, this is Brandon Turner's The Book on Real Estate Investing. Um, this is the guy that runs Bigger Pockets. And I'll also say that most of you agents out there, if you have an investor, that investor has heard or listened to Bigger Pockets um, or I've gotten a start or an idea from Bigger Pockets. They are looking up kind of, kind of these same type books. You don't want them coming in smarter than you. Right. This is your you job. You have to build trust, and the way this you build your, trust and rapport is through your competence and what you're your talking competence. about. Your Hundred percent. This is this is an unbelievably easy book to digest. I, I would venture to say there's not math in here that's above a sixth grade level. Um, very simple <laughs> division, multiplication, and that's most that the spreadsheets are as well. Um, this is nothing that is overly difficult. So a lot of people are just like, "Oh, I'm not good at math. I'm not either." All right, I'm a people person. I love talking to other humans um, and I don't even spell Which is most real so terms. I'm yes. not good at English either. So I'm like, uh, <laughs> but this is very, a very digestible book and at least the baseline for every single real estate agent. It kind of infuriates me that there's no standardized reading list, um, you know, for states to get licensed in there. Of almost every other class that you've gone to um, in high school or college has a baseline reading level. Um, so that was one that I would say is probably the baseline reading level for, for most agents dealing in the single family home or um, small to, you know, two to four unit um, kind of investors. Awesome. Awesome. So that, what else did we talk about? Um, oh, sourcing. And I know you said that you, you know, could, would answer that question offline, but if I wanted to find an investor, you mentioned this in our last conversation that a lot of these ownership pools are going to be LLCs. So you're, you're, it's not going to be a single owner. So how does a realtor even try to make relationships with people who have these assets? What would be your advice for someone that wanted to try to get into that sphere of, of network and, uh, and, you know, and influence? Uh, on the large commercial scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this, it, it is a, a lot Force harder to deal. break into. It, it is definitely a lot harder to get into. Um, they say there's like three ways to get into large commercial real estate. That's to be born into it. So like your family did it. Um, you choose a job where you're working at some part of the industry, whether you're working on a property management team, like on the property, um, that you're the asset manager. Um, or you're working in like the commercial mortgage lending sphere. Um, you're working directly for a broker in some capacity, um, doing, doing other different jobs, an analyst of some sort, um, or you pay for it. Um, and there are a lot of different courses. And that's eventually what I did after I talked to several different mentors. I probably called, I don't know, 
dozens, scores of people to try and just get information on how to get into this. Cause I knew I wanted to scale fast. I, I was over the single family home thing. I'd felt vacancy. I felt, and that's hundred percent vacancy. That hurts. hurts. Yeah. It's hundred um, percent. And I tell this to my military buyers all the time, diversify your liability. I yeah. call it the doors to mortgage ratio. <laughs> and then I got into the small multi multifamily and I loved it. And I was like, wow, I can live in one, rent out the other. I basically lived um, I lived like six years, basically not paying for my own mortgage. And I still do that now um, in the homes I, I currently live in. It. I have like a four bedroom, two bath house now. And I have a one bed, one bath bungalow in the back. And it generates almost 75 to 80% of my mortgage. Um, oh my. So there's just, there's ways to be comfortable. And there's, there was ways to ha house hack that, um, you know, to kind of get in. Um, but this one, after I, and I kind of got in that area to get to the, the large commercial level and the syndication level. Um, I called scores of people and finally got linked up with the right mentors. I talked to a guy um, who owns a very large um, kind of house flipping business in Florida. And I asked him about these paid programs. He's like, I'm all for it. I was, he said, I paid $25,000. And in the first year, I made $425,000. So I would say it was pretty good return on investment. Again, and that's where I was like, I am, I purposefully invested in my education. Whether your education is reading a ton of books on single family home investing, that's education. Whether you take a course and a very in-depth course, and not all courses are built the same. I'm, I'm not really for the boot camps and the weekend seminars. Those are to get you excited. Um, the course I did was a, a year long program that then led into a mastermind group. Um, that then led into a bunch of superhumans getting together and being like, we're going to put all of our brain energy together into, into doing uh, large multi-unit syndications. And then we still have an advisory group. Um, and that advisory group has like half a billion dollars of assets under management. Um, and we're constantly pinging stuff off of them all the time. Um, so here's something to motivate a, a, a realtor uh, who's looking to go into commercial because it's, it's like you have to overcome some hurdles. When you are paying a broker, what does the broker typically make on any given like trend? What do you budget for that? So it's a lot less because the numbers are a lot higher. I mean, mm -hmm. you're looking at like 1%, you know, 2%, 1%, maybe of, of 10 million. Um, you know. <laughs> So we're talking about a different kind of asset. So. Yeah. And so the, all these brokers too, I mean, they have, you know, unbelievable vocabulary. They have unbelievable depth of knowledge. Um, most of them worked as some kind of analyst to, before they became a broker. Um, so Lost your to, to kind of get into that, to kind of get into that realm of, um, of competence, you really have to work for it. Um, but I would say that's that starts right now. No matter where you're at in your investing or your realtor career, um, start picking up the books now. Start talking to as many people as you can. Find that broker that works in the area that you are at. Take him out to lunch. Ask him how he got there. And then ask him, how can you help me get there? And that most brokers and most people, um, they like that. They like that they're at the position they're at and they want to help others get to that area. So um, more often yeah. than not, I've seen, seen a ton of help come out of that for interested parties. Yeah. Okay, good. So that's more like the way to network is different. You know what I've seen? I've seen a lot of these boot camps. Um, I attended one um, this year actually with uh, the Rod Cleef organization and um, and it was interesting as a realtor. Well, first of all, it was interesting attending as a realtor. There was only like five other realtors in a room of like 250 people. And every conversation was about, every single conversation was about all these investors moving huge assets. Everyone wanted to buy or sell. And I was like, I don't know if this is a realtor's dream or nightmare because I clearly cannot talk to everybody in this room, you know, mm -hmm. but positioning yourself with these relationships and the crazier thing is is that it's not limited to your local market you know it's like your relationships that really have to spend the country in order for you to understand where the economy and where the opportunity is is real because is really where you know it's unbelievable and i'll tell you a quick story about that i run a local um panama city beach investor meetup which is basically focused on entry-level investors or um, people that have been doing it for a few years. Um, 
and met a guy there who came down from Wyoming to start doing some flips down here in Panama City after the hurricane. Um, we became, you know, good friends. And he said, hey, I got another guy who's interested in, in syndicating. Um, I'll give you his number. And I was like, that's awesome. I call him up. We have a great conversation. Um, and he's like, you know what's crazy? And I was like, what? He was like, I went to an investor meetup um, in Colorado, which is about 45 minutes away from my house, and met this guy, Samson. And then we decided to meet up and, and uh, go to lunch together. And Samson was telling me about syndicating. Samson is my business partner um, that I met through this <laughs> mastermind group that spanned the entire country through like four different people and a connection to, to link up with this one guy that both Samson in Colorado and me in Florida had talked to. Um, but that's also how kind of small the sphere of investing is. Right. Um, so your investors may be in Alaska now, um, but you may be able to help them or connect them to somebody in Florida. Um, and then you get a referral back because um, people are, are constantly moving. Now communication, they're constantly talking. Um, you know, your, your name is out there. So if your name is attached to confidence, attached to baseline knowledge, that can be verified and hopefully through numbers um, because not a single transaction that any agent does goes through without a number. There's, a, there's at least one number in that entire thing, um, the sale price, but you got to know all, all the influences coming in and all the influences that are going out to, to determine that price. And, you know, it's like what, what we mentioned when we chatted that first day, it's like the 1% of the 1% of agents play in this space. And that's why it is kind of like a, an under the radar type of, you know, like community of people and investors and property, you know, because um, it takes a lot of effort to number one, get smart in, into the space and then to actually get connected into the space. Um, so, you know, it's a huge opportunity for people that like my, my desire for even getting into investing at all, never started with like higher dollar assets, higher, higher motivation of, you know, of, of money, but it really was, how do I help my buyers create a, a wealth portfolio through their purchases, which the nature of that was, you know, teaching them how to invest. And so I fell into the desire for this arena through your natural desire to help people on a deeper mm -hmm. level than just selling them uh, the prettiest house they can afford. Because right. I, you know, and you've heard me say this before, it's if, if, you know, their dream home is always going to be in their dreams if they don't learn how to build the assets to have the passive income to get to their dream home, Correct. you know, and so you're not helping them. And with in investors, if they, if they even say they're an investor, just by saying that word, that means that's more than one normally. So and if you, if you help them make, make a smart investment off the start, off the very beginning, and they trust you, they're going to come back to you for deal after deal after deal after deal. And so you've just generated your own wealth stream from a single person. That's the difference between selling a house and developing a relationship. Right. You sell a house, that's one time. That's like, um, you know, I can give you a fish or I can teach you how to fish, right? So you as the agent, you're, you're supposed to be helping and guiding um, these buyers, whether they're a new single, you know, a new family um, with a new kid on the way, but you want to make them, you want to tell them this is good for them to live in now. And it's a good investment for the future of their child. That so, rings in people's brains. Absolutely. The, the long-term impact of the way that they're buying, you know, um, two points that I want to touch on with you really quick. Um, and I don't know which one to do first, but, um, cause I really want to talk about since you've mentioned syndication a couple of times and for mm -hmm. people that are not in the space that doesn't even, that, that, that vernacular is not always common in the residential space. So that, um, and also, and like creating teams around syndication, the way that commercial real estate works, uh, and that, so realtors understand where they can play on a team and where they can actually be an asset and a resource to investors. And so investors are buyers. It's synonymous with the word, you know, a buyer. So also how to take some, like someone who might have, you know, I have a, a buyer who had, who does have some a, a small portfolio of residential and how do I take a buyer that I know is interested into getting into this commercial space and, and bring them into that, 
that knowledge, right? So uh -huh. the syndication so, piece of the team. So syndication is like a fancy word for uh, a group of investors. Um, so what that group of investors can do, and, and most like any team, um, you know, two brains are better than one. Um, two pocketbooks are definitely bigger than one pocketbook. Um, so a syndication is kind of a fancy IRS and security exchange commission word for a group of investors that collect private money um, that then that private money they can pool together and they can buy an asset larger than any one of them could in the first place. And why most people strive to get to a syndication level um, is A, it's less risky. You spread the risk amongst a bunch of investors. You also spread the risk against a bunch of renters. Um, so if you're looking at that single family home and that thing goes unrented for one month, that's you know 100% vacancy. That's You're eating 100% of that monthly payment. If you're in a 100 unit place and you're at 96% occupancy and you have one person that goes out and you have to get that one rented out, that's not as much pain and there's, there's way less risk. Um, so that's kind of how we like the syndication world. Um, granted, there's a bunch of, there's a, there's a ton of different spheres once you get in the commercial, um, whether you can buy a retail shop, while you're buying uh, manufacturing plants, or you, know, you buy um, a strip mall or something like that. We just happen to focus in commercial multifamily in a sp very specific niche, um, which we look at B grade, um, garden what does style. B grade mean? So when so I hear investors, they talk all this lingo. And yeah. So I'm like, that doesn't mean I need to be a regular realtor. Four different <laughs> grades. A grade is like brand new, very nice. It's all the nice amenities you could want. Um, D grade is like you need to put on a flak jacket to go collect rent. <laughs> like there's uh, dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's like rough projects kind of stuff. Um, C is where you're looking at some of your low, maybe lower income. Um, neighborhoods uh you might have some section eight in some c's um but they're they're usually not as highly educated the b kind of area is mostly for people that have a, a good level of education these are usually your white collar workers entry level white collar workers um, or established blue collar workers or established tradesmen um, and in that area we find the least risk because in a recession, as we're going through now, um, A grades, those are what people wanted. It's not what people needed. So now they, they can't Go afford what they want. So they have to come down to B. Um, and then in the C and the Ds, those are the people that are most affected by unemployment. Um, so those are like the least likely to pay or to pay on time. But B grade, when you look at a recession, there's also like those kind of same four different levels of, um, of unemployment. The, the most, when they say like, oh, we're going to hit 20% un unemployment. Well, the vast majority of that 20% unemployment comes from a D grade tenant um, or a C grade tenant right in that B area. Um, and then those people that drop down from an A grade to a B grade, their unemployment levels are historically three to 5%. Right. So you're still in that B grade. Again, you're just reducing risk because the kind of tenant base you're going to get in the kind of area that you're going to get. Um, so that's also what we look at as a bunch of demographics. Does it have uh, a Starbucks next to it? Is there a Target close by? Um, mm -hmm. Is there a Whole Foods there? So we kind of look, look at that to spread the risk um, because other companies that have you know, multi-million dollar demographer departments that are looking at all these statistics. If, if they're planting there, that's how we kind of plant there. But it's also the same for single family homes. You're trying to get your, your clients close to good schools. You're trying to get them in places that doesn't have um, high levels of crime. You're trying to get them close to retail and stuff that makes their life convenient. Um, and that's the location, location, location piece. So it's not any different in syndication. There's just a couple of different rules as far as how you can collect money. Um, and then, you know, what you can and can't do with that, with that asset, um, and some beautiful tricks. I, I started learning about syndication. I was like, man, this is like, this is actually how people generate wealth, um, and, and lots of wealth in a very low risk manner. And I was like, I was just mad there for a while. Cause I was like, why don't they teach this in school? Right. Well, and even Eric Upchurch, one of my partners with active duty passive income, you know, he, um, in, 
eight months of really working um, at the network and calling and trying to source deals. And, um, he actually is a licensed realtor, but he doesn't sell real estate. But um, he, uh, he's, he closed 571 doors in eight months with no money, yeah. like of his own personal investment. So let's talk about that really quick. You've decided not to get your real estate license. And so tell me about like, why, why is it, where is it beneficial and where do brokers find themselves at risk? Um, you it's know. usually a little bit more in the smaller sphere in the, the single family homes to two to four units. When you're trying to close a contract, if you're an investor, but you also have your real estate agent license, you have to disclose a lot of different things. Um, to the person that you're potentially buying from. If you don't have your real estate agent's license, you don't have to disclose anything. Um, you can say, hey, this is why oh, I want to you, buy your house. You protect house. your interests. You protect your own interest. You can come to the table with a stronger form of negotiation. If you're an agent, you technically have those fiduciary responsibilities. Um, and you also have um, you know, morals and ethics code as a realtor that you've all had to sign and go on there. Not that real estate investors aren't um, morally or ethically bound because you are, and, and people will know if, if you're doing something dirty, you're a bad actor, you're, um, you're going to get dried up pretty quick um, because it is a relationship game. So that won't happen usually very often. Um, so, you know, whenever you're going into to one of these deals, as just a straight stick investor, you can just say, here's the capital I want to deploy. Here's the numbers I've run on your house. Will you accept this deal? And they either say yes or no. Hmm. And then I don't have to keep up with licensing. I don't have to keep up with fees. I don't have to go, you know, So it's basically like a, fizzbo, like a for sale by owner. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Not most of those. And then when you get into syndication, it, it doesn't matter that I don't know many large syndicators that have their um real estate license because it just it doesn't apply there's no like uh there's no doors that have to be open basically like with a lockbox. um whenever you're going to shop large multi-unit or commercial these commercial assets um especially multifamily, there's a leasing agent on on there they have you know different because they're with property rooms. management companies yeah, all there's a property management property so it's, management it's all company. open um, so but that's one way to find sellers is through these property management company relationships. Hundred percent. Because they've worked in that MSA, that that uh, metropolitan area. They they most likely know who the last couple owners have been. They know who owns the the next apartment complex over. You know, they they might have worked for the the last apartment complex. You know, they they know the area. We kind of call them the troops on the ground. Um, so again, it's just another level of relationship building. And, and a very, very strong one. Right. Um, and so what advantage would a real estate agent have for having your real estate license? What, what is their one? Um, a, for small multifamily investing, um, you can let yourself into a house. If, if there is one for sale um, and you see it pop on the MLS at 10 o'clock at night, at 10.01, you could be over that house checking it out. Um, you know, if it's vacant. So access. So, access and we're access talking more class. like 20 and down or depending on what the uh, this is like four unit and down oh you're talking about residential okay yeah kind and of even then if it's and... occupied i have to coordinate mm -hmm. yeah so you got to coordinate um you have a little bit more access you definitely have access to the mls um but as i'll hear you know time and time again it's like build your team build your team build your team build your team um when i'm investing in small multi-units or single family homes i'm i'm using that agent hopefully the one with the competence to go on my behalf to look at these things and screen out some of them because i don't have time i'm looking at a bunch of different things um i need them to kind of screen out i'm like here's my metrics here's the number points i want to hit here's the rates i want to hit of return go look at houses and then they bring me a pool of 10 um and so i kind of use them as troops on the ground as well and if it's not a market i'm familiar with they know the market so i'm, I'm taking their input a lot on why this location's good or you know why this duplex instead of this triplex and so t this is a good segue into um the gro your growth view the company that you're with and what are you what do you guys look for from realtors in con in communities across the country like what like right now if you had to say i'm looking for deals in colorado utah like 
tell me a little bit more about that. So we, we start off from the, the big sphere. I told you that metropolitan statistical analysis. So we mm-hmm. look at only the metropolitan areas um, that have the population that we want to hit. So try to be over 500,000. But we'd like to be over a million at anywhere we're at uh, right now has the population growth, income growth that we're looking for in that area. That's, that's what's going to drive up our net operating income called NOI mm-hmm. for a building. Um, as we increase the rents in there. Um, And we're looking for business-friendly states and landlord-friendly states. Um, So right now, we're kind of looking in the Texas markets, uh, the Georgia markets, and the North Carolina and South Carolina markets. Um, uh, They have strong demographics. Um, And then we we start talking to the brokers in those large areas. Um, Let's say, for example, uh, Raleigh-Durham. One of my partners is in Raleigh-Durham. So she's establishing... She's calling up brokers and saying, hey, we're looking for um, 80 plus unit B grade garden style, which means like three to four stories, no elevators, have pitched roofs, the the nice one that has pools in it, and we can put a dog park in and playground in it, Um, between $8 million and $12 million, because we know between the team that we can- Yeah, in Raleigh. uh, What Raleigh? are in Raleigh? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then- uh, (laughs) And then, so we, we kind of um, go, we talk to a lot of different brokers in there and then they start pushing us deal flow into our emails and we just kind of start looking at the deal flow, seeing if it matches our criteria. Is it post 1980? So we don't have to worry about asbestos and lead-based paint. Is it B grade? Is it garden style? Is it in our kind of price point? Um, and so if it's yes, then we move it over to the yes pile. Um, and then we do what we call a neighborhood screen on it. Um, and then we go to look at the crime rates. We go look at the income level for that uh, area. And we look at the education level at that area um, to kind of hit all those things that people want to live in. If it passes that screen, then we move it into the spreadsheet part. And we do what we call a back of the napkin. And I love, love my spreadsheet guys because their back of the napkin is way different than my back of the napkin. Mine's like <laughs> over some beers or like a pen. <laughs> Theirs is still 60 lines, yes. you know, where they're looking at different things. Um, if it I don't accept that under math over beer. I won't be able to calculate. <laughs> yeah. If it passes that statistical analysis, um, then we go into a deeper underwrite. And some of those underwrites themselves, you know, per line item, we're looking at everything from taxes to door count, type of, type of unit that it's in. Um, we're looking at, you know, how to... Um, how to do construction, light and value add projects on it, how much that's going to cost. Uh, we're looking at advertising costs. We're looking at administrative costs. I mean, we're diving into every piece of the finances. Um, and then it'll, it'll pop out a number, and then it helps us determine, hey, is this a good deal um, for us based on the lending rates? Um, and then we can put our letter of intent. So we'll literally look at thousands of properties to get to maybe three to put an offer in on. Um, and... And now that I know that, I wish I would have done that on the very first house I would have bought. <laughs> look, at, look at the larger area, look at the neighborhood, figure out how to do some very simple neighborhood screens. And, and you can look at, there's um, like, you can look at the school scores on some free school websites. You can look at free crime rates for an area that you're going to be in on different uh, um, websites. You can look at different income levels on the Census Bureau um, website. So all these are free free mm-hmm. demographic material you just have to look at it um so once you look at that information on the on the screen for your single family home then you run the numbers on it hey does this make sense in a very simple spreadsheet if it does then you can pursue it more so same right. principles apply from big down to the, the low it's just the big has you know bigger numbers and smarter investors so most of the people you're you're talking to and getting money for they've been very successful at some walk of life um, I'm consistently talking to surgeons and doctors and lawyers, um, senior military members. These because you these raise capital are, for your firm. Basically, you actually you you meet with people who want to invest their money, and correct. is that what you do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and most of these people they want passive returns, and a lot of them it's, it it sounds terrible, but a lot of them have too much time, or or not enough time, and too much money. Um, like doctors. Like doctors, they work in 80 hour weeks on a surgical ward. You know, he's got a ton of money. He doesn't know what to do with it. He's getting killed by taxes and wherever the state he's living in, he's looking at how to shelter some of that taxes. So what, what they love about real estate that, that 
you can't get from stocks is you can make money like four different ways. So the first way is cash flow. The second way is appreciation. So we're forcing the appreciation up by increasing rents and increasing the net operating income. Uh, principal pay down, you have 100 tenants that are paying down your principal on your loan. Um, and then uh, huge tax deductions through depreciation, depreciating the asset. Um, so all that flows directly to each of the individual investors. Um, so when I came into the commercial real estate space and I heard multiple people talk about how they had zero taxes for like six years plus in a row. And then I was like, huh, because yes. there's one thing that hurts realtors really, really, really bad and it's taxes. Right. So, so I, when I you become an actual investor, that's how you offset your tax mitigation with becoming a, a more of a, 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 a partner in the actual investment process and not just being the realtor selling it, but investing. Correct. And that's dollars. another question I ask every single realtor when I'm interviewing them in a new area. I ask them first, do you have any investment properties? If they don't, then I'm like, you, you don't know my burden. Uh, the second one is- You don't know uh, my problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't know my problem. You don't know my problem set. Um, and then I have them like, hey, can you define what a cash on cash return on investment is? Um, and they can kind of say what that is or, or show me equations even better. Um, then I know being like this guy or girl might know what they're talking about. Um, but that, that's a first level. That's a, just a first competence check there. Um, but it's no different from when actually when we're talking to brokers in our world, they're interviewing us as well. They want to make sure that the buyer is competent enough, that the buyer has the money and the capital pool that they say they do so they can close the deal because those brokers don't eat unless they make deals. So they want to make sure that they, yeah, that they want to make sure that they are working with buyers that can actually close. Right. No, absolutely. So we had one question is what's the name of the first book again um, from Dan? Uh, yes. The, uh, the first book is called The Book on Rental Property Investing by Maybe. Brandon Turner. Brandon Turner. And that will uh, kind of give you the baseline vocabulary to start being able to talk to investors. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. What and else? Any of those... Any people that are uh, interested in syndicating and becoming a syndicator um, or maybe leading some of their clients to syndication groups, um, always my website, um, our website is thegrowthview.com, the growth view and view spelled V-U-E. Um, I'll, and then I'll make sure to put it right here too, the, thegrowthview.com. And then one of the best books uh, I've read on that is a book called Getting the Money by Susan Lassiter Lyons. Um, getting the money? Getting the money. How to raise $250,000 in private money in the next 30 days. And I have to tell you, a lot of it is um, drinking beers, which I love to do. I just meet up <laughs> with different investors. We, uh, before the quarantine, we'd meet up at this one place I love in town, have a couple beers, um, and just talk them through the pro why I'm excited about syndicating and all the things I've kind of said on here, the lower risk, the higher returns, the, the team effort that's in it. It's so much better than just going at it yourself. Um, being able to scale fast. I had one person today. I was like, man, could you imagine trying um, to figure out 30 different rents right now um, and different properties? I'm like, no, I cannot, but I can imagine my property manager figuring out rents for the, the one asset that I own. It just happens to have a hundred doors. Right. Um, so it's just the economies of scale. Um, economies of big numbers are, uh, are, are usually inconsistently by rule a lot less risky. Um, so that kind of got me really excited in it. And, and Susan Lester Lyons, that how to raise um, $250,000 in private money. You can raise that money to buy a bunch of single family homes. If that's your thing, you can use it to buy a bunch of multifamily homes. If that's your thing, but find a place that gets you excited. Um, find the business principle that gets you excited. And then it's just naturally easy to talk to people um, about why you're excited about it. I, I, I get super excited every time I have a call because I get to reiterate why I'm excited about it. <laughs> I love that. Awesome. Well, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. So if you don't have anything else, uh, we plugged your website. Um, make sure people can reach you. 
Yeah. And then uh, I, I work still off my personal email because those personal relationships mean a lot to me. Um, so it's just my last name, Brad at gmail.com. And I'm one of the things that gets me most excited is helping people get started. Mm-hmm. I, I love helping people get started and, and seeing people's excitement um, and then building those relationships. And uh, in general, throughout this business and throughout life, the more you give, the more you'll get. Um, so if all these agents just remember that the more you give a family, um, the more you're going to get in long-term business and relationships and personal satisfaction. Um, so just continuously think of yourself as that servant. You are serving that buyer. You are serving that seller. You are serving that investor. If you kind of go in with that mindset, um, you'll never be hungry. You'll never be looking for a paycheck. You'll never be looking for a job. People will be knocking down your doors. So just find a way to serve everybody that's around you um, and they'll take care of you. Absolutely. I love that. It's a, such an important thing to live by, especially in this industry. Especially. Well, thanks, Brad. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.